Oh, all right. Um, I hope you guys had a good Valentine's Day. I was going to ask you about what you did today, but um, yeah, we had some technical difficulty on Linda's side, which I'm sure she'll figure out eventually. But let's take a moment of silence together. Uh, let's pray that uh, the joy of being found will be ours. Uh, that this, this will mark our Christian walk, that there's celebration and there's, uh, there's joy in our life as we uh, journey with God. Or, yeah. So let's take a, this moment of silence. And when you feel ready to pray, that's how, she'll, that's how we shall pray. Okay. Father, although um, these three parables were told in the context of Pharisees complaining, but often there's something beautiful that comes out of brokenness and sin. And we're so glad that we have these parables to know what your heart is like and how much you love us and how you deal with sinners and uh, giving us glimpse to what um, life should be like as a younger son, living in celebration and joy and recognizing that living as the older son caught up in legalism and doing the right things, but never enjoying and never um, celebrating with what, what, what he has. Uh, I, I pray that we will not be caught up in either way, but there will be lots of celebration and joys and gladness and thankfulness in our life. That we admit to you that we're plagued by our, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, uh, yeah, our guilt, that we feel guilty that we're somehow not good enough. And uh, I, I pray that some of that will be uh, put away and, and give us way and, and room towards mercy, uh, the joy and celebration. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay. Turn on the video. There we go. Share screen. Screen, screen. Is this the right screen? No, it's not. Ah, here we go. <laughs> Okay, um, great to see you again. And today we're going to go on to session, actually it's three, but it's session two on my, uh, the little curriculum that I'm making. I don't know if there's anyone else that joined us. Uh, nope. So people who are not here today, I'm just, I'm just gonna assume that they're on a date and spread rumors. Um, so before we start, I just want to ask you guys uh, if you remember anything from last week. And this is last week's text that we dealt with, chapter 15, verse 1 to 2. We just dealt with two verses. And yeah, just share anything that you recall and re you remember from last week. And that'll be our like self-interactive review before we get started. And for those of you who are joining um, through maybe YouTube for the first time or Facebook Live, just kind of watching us on that uh, different platforms, we're going through the prodigal son, the parable of prodigal son, but um, it's expanded version because Jesus tells the parable of hundred one lost sheep and one lost coin and the prodigal son as a package. Okay, so I'm just kind of talking away while you recall what we talked about last week. Are we here to listen or are we complaining? What do you mean? Pharisees are complaining. I don't know. I don't know if that was a joke. Oh, from last week, okay. <laughs> yeah, um, so that's right. Yeah, are, are we here to, um, oh, I see what you mean. You're, you're contextualizing it. Yeah, so um, in, in the presence of God, are we here to complain about people around us who's not good enough or we feel is not up to our par on, on spiritual walk? And, and that's really deep. Um, I, or are we here to really listen to Christ? Okay, so thank you. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, sinners were clear and they, they drew close to Jesus. And we don't, you know, um, and it, it's, this is a kind of, um, I don't know if I'm reading into it or not, but 
Pharisees are there, and they're probably just as close to Jesus as sinners are. But yet, um, just like in the story of prodigal son, the younger son is now closer, and the son is the older son is you know relatively close to the father, but there's a big gap in distance. So some of that is playing out in the real world, and some of that is playing out in the parable of the prodigal son. So there's nearness that sinners have, that sinners enjoy with, with God. Anything else from last week? Well, let me throw out a question for you. And this is not a review, but um, one of the people uh, actually emailed me after Life Devo and, and brought the subject up. Um, what it means to be a tax collector. Um, oh yeah, Jesus ate with them. Thank you. Uh, that when people, when sinners came, quote unquote, sinners and tax collectors, that they came to listen, but Jesus went step one step further. Uh, to not only teach them, but to eat with them, to offer his fellowship, and and, and by virtue of eating, uh, that he's accepting them as his friends. Big deal. It is really a big deal. Um, so what does it mean to be a tax collector, and what does it mean to be a sinner? And it's sort of a, I guess, a segue into tonight. Um, do we feel that we're one of the tax collectors? Do we feel that we're sinners or are they just too much of a sinner and too much of um, abstraction that we don't relate to them or you don't relate to them? Okay. So last week we set up the whole story of what is happening in real world, in Jesus world, and that precipitated telling these parables. Okay. And... So I'm going to invite you. Oh, perfect. Let's see if I can even make, make this even gooder. There we go. Thanks around. Okay, so tonight I'm going to ask you to read um, these water from verse three to verse 10. So I'm gonna give you five minutes. Um, Yeah, I, I think I said this before, but pay attention to the emotional undertone of the shepherd, of the woman, or any woman, or any shepherd um, who would go through something like this, okay? And see if there are any repetitions and repeating themes, because Jesus is telling essentially three stories that builds up on each, each other, but they, they do share a strong similarities, okay? And contrast which is really important to look at. Okay, so I'll see you guys in five minutes. Okay, thank you for reading and sharing and writing. All right, so I'm just gonna read some of your answers and then I'm gonna move down to some of the questions that I, I, I wrote. And I had a whole bunch of questions and, and some of them I think are better than others, obviously. I took out the worst ones. Um, but it would be kind of nice um, to go through them and see how you respond and how I feel about them too. So um, yeah, it would be really helpful in forming this one-on-one um, -on -one kind of a mentor curriculum because I, I really feel that um, there's a lack of joy in Christianity. Uh, John Piper, uh, I'm not a strong um, follower, I guess you could say, of, of John Piper, although I have great respect for him. Um, but he, he you're, if, if you're not aware already, uh, he coined a phrase, Christian hedonism. And hedonism, of course, is a Greek mythology or, or Greek thinking of like, you know, um, of celebration, joy, uh, almost to a fault, like the hedonistic living. Um, but he trying to reclaim that word, I guess, uh, by putting Christian in front of hedonism, that there is um, this kind of uh, almost reckless joyfulness, overflowing uh, euphoria, if you will, of being a Christian. 
that we are saved by grace and that we were lost and we are found and we were sinners, but now we're righteous. We were orphaned, but um, now we are his children. And, and then if I may add to that, um, I, I mean, yeah, continuing on with that, it, we're, we're forgiven. There's a restoration of relationship and that, that really feels good. Um, especially if you, if, if you have, if you had uh, conflict in your, you know, with your significant one or your friends or whatever, and um, when there's restoration and everything works out, you know, it just feels great. So I really want to bring in that joy um, and shifting of identity of being lost to found. And also, um, how do we get there kind of thing? And I hope this uh, curriculum as once it gets honed and, and it gets tested again, um, I, I, I pray that this will lay the foundation um, for Bridgeway people to really enjoy being in God's presence and enjoy him forever. Okay. All right. Let's go. Um, lost and found equals joy. And, and that's precisely what I'm talking about. That there is great joy in being found. And let me ask you, who is the most joyous? Um, <laughs> see, there's different comments. Yeah, who is, a, who is most joyous in these two parables? Yeah, the finder. Because, um, and, and why do you think that is? Rather than me spilling the beans. Now, why do you think that is? <laughs> yeah, ownership makes a difference. That's right. Ownership makes a difference. And what else is there? Let me ask you a question. Who, who loves more, um, typically speaking? Okay, not in absolute terms, but typical uh, general terms. Dad and mom versus their kids. Do parents love their kids more or do kids love their parents more? Parents? <laughs> Question mark. <laughs> yeah. uh, I swear you're going with that. Um, yeah, typically it is, it is the owner who purchased and has vested interest. It's the parents um, who typically loves more because they sacrifice more for the kids. And if you just, if you maybe um, measure love based on who can sacrifice more uh, foolishly, willfully, you, you know, it's, it's usually the parents, right? Um, I mean, tables do get flipped around, but I, I, I wanna go with that. So there is something about um, God losing us and, and there is, um, he has greater vested interest in us. He really does want to find us. And um, what was it? Lost and found. Yeah, so there's the, the one that is joyful uh, is interestingly is, is God himself because God is, the father in the story is represented by God uh, or the father, father in the story is representing God. Um, so it's, we have to, this is not another additional thing that you must do. Oh, you know, terrible you, how dare you feel, feel guilty all the time and you don't have any joy. Um, although all, God has given all these great things for you, our joy comes, I, it, that's, this is not wh where this is going. The joy is that God rejoices much more than we ever could. And, and, and that's where I get my joy when I read this story, that I'm the one who should, be, who should experience greatest joy, but I'm not, it's God himself. And when I think about that, I feel pretty good about myself, don't you? Um, that I'm, I'm so important to him, and that gives me joy. Uh, and in, in addition to that, of course, the restoration and salvation and, uh, redemption and forgiveness, all that. But it just, anyway, moving on. Um, Mac has uh, scientifically, numerically uh, 
aligned some of the re repetition. When you look at verse four and verse eight, uh, what man of you having a hundred sheep? Okay, and verse eight says, or what woman having ten silver coins? I, I or originally had this question, but I, I struck it out because I, I figure it's going to come up anyway. But what do you think about those two verses? When you put them together, um, what comes up for you? What man? What woman? Mm, you know what? I'm not going to go through all that, but I'm just going to affirm that there are repetitions. What man, what woman, and there's something being found, and there's great rejoicing, and that this is, um, that there's joy, and there's repentance, and there's sinners coming before God. Okay, so these are big overarching themes that gets repeated, that something was lost, it gets found, and it gets only found because uh, the owner looked for it. Sheep didn't look for the shepherd. The coin obviously did not look for the woman. Um, but the one who lost their prize item is the one that is pursuing it and pursuing it to a great deal. Just like uh, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Uh, and, and you see that the, the idea of that is that the Lord is pursuing his sheep and his flock. But there are contrasts, which uh, they are pointed out. Um, there, yes, there is some omission about. Uh, well, there is inclusion of ninety-nine sheep, uh, and, and there is omission of nine coins because probably because coins cannot um, celebrate because they're not sentient. But I sometimes think um, Jesus deliberately chose inanimate object in his second parable, uh, that you have this item that just cannot find its way back. It is stuck where it is at. Um, how do I phrase, how would I phrase this question? Um, In what way is one sheep that is lost and one coin that is lost similar to the younger son and the older son? Does that make sense? Um, it is one of those interesting things that I thought about. I thought these two stories can be superimposed onto the last parable. In what way is a lost sheep and lost coin similar to the younger son and the older son? So I guess I'm saying that lost sheep is kind of like the younger son and the lost coin is kind of like the older son. Yeah, <laughs> isn't that cool? Um, did Jesus like think of this on the spot? <laughs> but yeah, it's... The younger son, just like he went away and is far away and shepherd has to go and pursue. And the coin is somewhere in the house. It's not far away. It's in the vicinity. It's very close, very near. But yet the owner doesn't say, the woman doesn't say, oh, you know what? It's in the house. You know, I don't have to look coin doesn't just walk off, it's in the house. Um, but the interesting thing is that the coin is so close, yet it is lost. And the older son is so close, yet he is lost. Jesus, so smart, yeah. But maybe I'll mention that story towards the, uh, I'll mention that point towards the end. Um, it, when, I, when I do it for reals uh, in, in conclusion. Okay, so I got some questions for you. I hope you can read them. I'm gonna make it bigger. I noticed that on YouTube, my screen didn't show up fully, which is kind of odd. And I hope you guys can see it. Uh, yeah, let, let's just go through the list. Uh, what time is it? 
Okay, we have plenty of time. What What do you think of the uh, emotional undertone of the shepherd and the woman when they realize that something is missing? What are they feeling? What would you? How would you feel if you just went to work or came home and you realized something's missing? Worry, okay. Devastated, very unsettled, yeah. It's like you come home and um, one of your kids are missing, like, hmm. <laughs> yeah, upset, upset. But you know, sometimes uh, I think maybe I would feel um, bitter. Is bitter the right word? But you know, like, oh man, not again. Like that that sheep again, like this is not happening to me. And I'm only saying that um, because I, I think Pharisees felt that way. Um, but Jesus is saying, you know, no good shepherd would feel that way. And the woman would feel upset, uh, feeling unsettled, something's missing, devastated. And um, the reason why I ask these questions is because I think Jesus is trying to reveal God's, um, God's heart, what is in him when he sees sinners go missing, when he sees people go missing in their sin, um, that he's not aloof, he's not cool and collected and settled, he really is unsettled and um, to a point where he makes a weird decision to send his son. Um, and that's what's unsettling about Christianity. And, and people are upset and they don't believe in Christianity because God sent his son. They find that strange. And um, some people will say it is abusive and it's odd. Um, but there is certain kind of love the father and the son has, just like in the story of prodigal son, you know, it's not just the father looking for the younger son, but it's the father and the son. So when you think of it that way, it's not so unsettling, but um, it can be if you don't have all those details and then um, the larger scope of what God is doing. So I, the part of the joy that we get is that um, from following God is that he really did look for you. Uh, he, he longed for you when you weren't there, uh, and he is glad that you are home and that you are, you are found, and he celebrates not only himself, but the whole heaven, his entire kingdom. Um, you know, in the prodigal story, the older son doesn't celebrate, and it's a weird that the town would celebrate with the father, too, because they typically wouldn't. If it's a real life, they wouldn't. But he's showing that in the kingdom, um, the whole heaven celebrates. Yeah, the pe townspeople would not celebrate. <laughs> yeah, maybe out of respect for the father, but uh, they, they what typically what they would do is they would burn grains or something uh, like a corn, and they would take him to the town center um, and, and they would dump it on him and they would shame him for being an idiot, and then they, and then he would go home. And then he would just get his um, beating there. So, but, you know, there's this father who rejoices and, and, and there's kingdom that rejoices. And that gives us a bit of a confidence, doesn't it? And, and boldness. All right. I think I'm going to take this one out. Yeah. See, this is why I do this with you guys. Um, because once you write it down and you, when you get into actual thing, you, you kind of know what doesn't work. Um, what do you think is going through the mind of the woman who lost? No, oh, yeah, I think I want to take that one out too. Maybe one day. Okay. Oh, I, I did include this, but yeah, I wasn't sure. Okay. Um, ba -ba -dum, ba -dum. Yeah, you know what? I, I, I think, no, I'm not going to mention it. All right. So we talked about um, the contrast and, and similarities and differences. And um, the big thing that I, I mentioned here is that the, the difference between a sheep and a coin is now being parallel to the difference between uh, the younger son and the older son. 
and and that that gives some sort of gauge of um, am I really am I experiencing joy today or am I am I an older son am I the older son who does everything Christiany but yet I still have I still don't have joy and if that is you um, then maybe you're in the right place and, and you're thinking about this text and, and, and meditating on it. Uh, that, that might help you. Okay, so let, let's let's share. What does it mean to be lost? Do you think? What does it mean to be lost for a sheep, a coin? Uh, we're not going to get into the actual prodigal son, but what does it mean to be lost from the text and maybe just definitionally? Not where you're meant to be. Okay, well, that's interesting. Possibly in danger. Okay, okay. I'll write some of these down, some of the thoughts that come to my mind. Not with the owner. Oh, these are really just wonderful definitions. Now protected by the shepherd, prone to attack, to be attacked with F. Sounds like a serious attack. Wandering around, oh, or stuck somewhere, can't get yourself out. Alone, oh, isolation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think these are all the words and definitions that we all relate to. No purpose or direction. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So let's think then, and you, you can type more as, as you listen, but does any of these things describe you? So you're not lost in the sense that the prostitutes in the story are lost. You're not selling your body for money. Um, or your enemy of the state, you're a tax collector or you're robbing somebody. But do any of these things apply to you? Okay, you don't have to answer, but we're just looking at them and say, you know, I'm dangerous to myself because I hold false truth all the time. And I listen to the false truth. For instance, you're not good enough if you don't do this or if you don't have that. Uh, that you're not with God. That you see yourself as the owner of your destiny. And you're working yourself to the bone and driving yourself to the ground because um, it, the sovereignty does not lie with God, but it lies with you. Okay. Or that you just feel you're wandering, you're marching to a different beat as I shared on Sunday, or maybe you're stuck mentally in, in your life and, and you feel lost. And in that lostness, not only do you feel lost, but in that place, maybe there are things that you do to cope that is really sin. Uh, you, it, you're not coming to God, but you're just trying to cope like the story of prodigal son, he's coping through getting, uh, working for a, far, a pig farmer and he's trying to cope through eating pig's food and you just keep going and going and going. Okay. So you're turning to everything and anything and anyone but God. Does that describe you? And that's something that I want you to think about. What does it mean to be lost? And are you lost in some way? Okay. And the next question that I want you to think about is, um, why does God search for the lost? Yeah, I, I think I can phrase that better, but why does he look for the lost? Leave no one behind. Is that Lilo and Stitch? 
know, he loves, he loves his children. Mm. We are his. Oh, I like that one. Yeah. He considers us his. Wow. That gives me joy. Mm -hmm. He loves. He doesn't want to lose anyone that, is, that belongs to him. And... Um, in fact, that's an interesting one there because the story goes from 100 sheep, 10 coins to two kids. And um, what is an acceptable quantity of loss? 50%, 10%, 1%. And it's really, you, re you realize God doesn't settle at 99%. He only settles for 100 yeah, that he looks for his because he loves them. And, and we have some confidence of that because, and I, I'm going to bring this in now, um, verse four and eight, I think it was, what man of you or what woman? So it, it's really, this is really cool for me because, um, oopsies, Jesus is appealing universality. There is no man that would, allow one sheep to go missing and he's saying there is no woman that would allow uh would, would feel sufficient to have nine coins when she had 10. so there's man and woman and in terms of gender uh, when we just had two uh, you know uh, there's a universality of nobody thinks like that if human beings are like that there's no man and woman like that what about God? He would never think like that either. He will look for you. That's what Jesus is saying. And, and that's the contrast between Jesus' attitude towards sinners and that of Pharisees. And I'm just going to whisk uh, through this. They're different because um, Pharisees want to have them apart from their life. But Jesus wants to include them in their life, in his life. Okay, so the question is, uh, as we close tonight, I, uh, the question that I want you to think about is, um, do you identify with 99? Maybe the Pharisees, uh, maybe the elder son, or do you identify with one lost sheep because uh, you have experienced being found by God and there's joy of being found? Mm, this one's a little bit awkward. Okay, let's see if this works better. Okay. Um, so that's the question that I want to want to think. I want you, I want you to think about: Is there joy in your life? And if not, I I want you to think about all the things that we mentioned tonight: the universality of men and women, um, and by extension, God wanting His things back because we are his, even though we have sinned. Uh, so I want you to think about that. But tonight, um, I want us to, I, I want to close with repentance. What does repentance mean? And um, I think it was some scholars um, thought about the idea of repentance does not mean being close. Uh, if that's the case, then the lost coin is not lost, it's close. So it, it, it must not be lost because he's very close to his owner. But repentance is not you, you it's not you being really close to religious activities and, and religious people um, like yourselves and doing Christian activities, but it is you facing which direction are you facing so the sheep can be one sheep can be farther from all the other 99 but if that one sheep is looking at the shepherd 
then that sheep is found. It's not lost. Repentance is, is kind of like that, where we may have ventured far away, um, like in Isaiah 53, all, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquities of, iniquities of us all. Um, that that we, have, we may have ventured far away, but we now look to Christ, uh, look to God, and he accepts us. That's repentance. That we're, not, we're no longer looking at the world and the things, um, but we're looking at God. And I think that's part of the joy. The part of the joy of repentance is not that you have perfected it all. You got everything right, but that you are looking at God who's looking for you. That when you are lost, you can you cannot find your find your way back, but you found God who, um, who found you. I, I hope that makes sense. But anyway, uh, that's all I'm going to share tonight. So please think about: Is there joy? in my life? Is, is there repentance in my life? Am I lost? And, and, and if so, in what way, in what area of my life? Okay. All right. Any other questions? Uh, any questions or comments? Final thoughts about um, the lesson? Did I miss anything? Last week, Linda mentioned, please define what sinner means. Uh, is there anything like that? No, no, no. Ah, repentance is what does it, re repentance mean? Yeah, it's a tricky one, isn't it? But repentance is um, looking in God's direction. And I know even that is a little abstract. But you're looking in, in, in God's direction in helplessness and in complete surrender. And in that moment, um, you're, you're truly found. Uh, there is a confusing aspect here because um, there is sovereignty and, and the grace of God and it's all him who's looking and he, and he, and he finds us. So when, maybe if I give an illustration, it would be easier. Let's say you, you have no joy and you're lost and you can't get rid of whatever is making you lost and you don't want to give it up. Even if you wanted to, you don't know how to give it up. It is when you say, Lord, uh, help me. I, I, I am lost. I'm a sinner. I don't know what to do. I don't want to give up the sins that I, I have. I don't want to give up my addictions and the patterns of way, the patterns of thinking and doing. I think that's repentance that you're, you're finally facing God. And, and um, that repentance is, is a signal. Oddly, that is a signal that God has found you. Weird, right? But didn't I just repent? Didn't I initiate? No, I think it's, it's God who initiated that repentance. And that's where the confusion lies. But I said it, but was it God? The prodigal son came back, but was it because he came back that he was accepted? And um, I explained this before. No, it's, it's by grace of his father. Or repentance is, yeah, I hope that makes sense. Uh, repentance is acknowledging we need him. Yeah, it, it, repentance is acknowledging that we, we are helpless and that we, we utterly, absolutely need him because sometimes we don't even want to turn back to him. And, and that's the confession that we make. Hey, I know that song. <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, <laughs> Daryl, <laughs> Decky, let's sing a song. Anyway, Linda, does that make sense? And I, you know, in some ways there should be a tension and sort of, no, it kind of doesn't make sense. Because um, human responsibility and God's sovereignty, they don't quite mix neatly together into a, into a single bag. Anyway, you can you can call me, email me. I gotta I gotta let these poor people go. All right, let's pray. Father, let there be joy in our life, and let our turn our eyes upon Jesus. 
and let us turn to him as, as helpless sinners, as just like the two thieves on the cross. What have they achieved and accomplished? But it's just saying, Lord, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. Um, God, I pray that we will face you rather than face in the direction of the world or things that we've been longing after. We pray that there will be great joy in our life by knowing that you're looking for us because we're yours. Although we have done nothing but to offend you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.